the next one, <laughs> that one. Okay. How many have ever said, life is good? How many feel that way today? <laughs> Most of you. That's a good thing. You ever heard somebody say, you know, when I was a kid, we used to do all this fun stuff, and then life happened. Yeah. Have you ever heard somebody in an answer to a troubling situation say, well, what are you going to do? That's life. I think God wishes we'd make up our minds. <laughs> when we think about life, because he made it to be a blessing. I think it's interesting that, that human beings contradict ourselves once in a while. We'll say, life is short. And then on the other hand, we'll say, this, this is lasting a lifetime. <laughs> or maybe life goes way too fast. Or life just doesn't seem to go fast enough. The older we are, the shorter the period of time we have on this earth ahead of us than we've experienced in the past. That's why when you're young, you think you're never going to turn 16 and get that driver's license. That's something that's changed. I, man, on my 16th birthday, we were at the DMV and I got my permit. I could not wait. My sister was two years, well, still is, two years older than me, and she got her driver's license, and I was fit to be tied. I just had to drive. It's changed a little bit today. Kids aren't in that big of a hurry. My dad used to say, son, don't wish your life away. The older you get, the faster it goes. But I do believe we kind of have this love-hate relationship. We talk about if someone's in prison, for a capital crime, a lot of times they have a life sentence, and life just drags on and drags on, and they think it's never going to end. Or we could uh, have uh, either a life of heartache, where we can say that when we think of life, we think of heartache, we think of the things that people have done to us in the past, we think of the mistakes that we've made in the past. But God intends us not to have a life sentence, but a life of freedom. Not to have a life of heartache, but a life of possibilities. And here's the thing. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the choice. You have the choice of how you're going to approach life. A couple of weeks ago, I had a message. This has turned into a series. It was not my intention. This was just a God thing. A couple of weeks ago, I uh, started with a message about rest. We talked about rest and that the world has a different interpretation of rest than the church does or should. There's physical rest and then there's resting in Christ. Yes. That's when we rest from our labors, not that we stop working or retire young. It means we rest from trying to earn favor with God by what we do and don't do. And we come into a place where we realize that we cannot be justified without Jesus. God cannot look upon us as clean without Jesus. And we come to that point in our lives and we just say, I want to trust you. I want to rest in Christ. And then last week I talked about hope and how the world has a different in interpretation of hope than kingdom people do. Because the world looks at hope as wishing. And we said, you know, like the, the Walt Disney version, when I wish upon a star. And that Christians don't, don't wish we have a hope and that hope is not just something that might happen, but something that does happen when we give our life to Jesus and we're born again. We have a hope for this life, and we have a hope for the next. And today, it's kind of along that same, that same line of life. Life is precious. Human life is precious. All life is precious. And we may be like that lady in the picture and lay down in the grass and just say, life is good. But the kind of life that I want to make sure we cover today is not just the physical life that we breathe in air and we exhale. This is the life that we're given in Jesus Christ, that new life that he gives, that kind of really, if we let ourselves believe this way, erases that line that we mark at the grave. 
and says, my new life starts at the moment I'm born again, and I just continue to live. It's, it's funny to me how the people that look forward to heaven most of all seem to really get beat up over what they have to do to get there. Dying. Death should not be any big deal for the believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we can waste an awful lot of precious life worrying about dying. It's been said during the pandemic that we were so busy trying not to die that we forgot how to live. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about life. I'm going to take you to three different places today. The scripture won't be on the screen. It's a good chance for you to get a little practice in turning some pages in your Bible. I would encourage you to do that today and follow along. Um, whether that's the paper kind or the digital kind, it's all the Word of God, that's all right. I'm just going to look at three different places in Scripture, starting in Genesis 2. You know, chapter 1 of Genesis seems like an overview. It's, it, it, it looks at the six days of creation in a very brief uh, kind of approach. And when we get into chapter 2, there's more of a focus on what happened on the six days, specifically when God created man. And we get some more details out of chapter 2 that we didn't get in chapter 1. But I just want to look at this one verse here, Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. That's the New Living Translation. Different translations will, will say being, maybe a living being. I think it's the King James that says a living soul. And it's fair that we would have that many words because the, the Hebrew word that's used there, nephesh, it can mean soul, self, life, creature, person, appetite, mind, living being, desire, emotion, and passion. And I think it's worthwhile looking at the lexicon to understand what that word means because that's, that's like all-encompassing, isn't it? A living being, a living person, a living soul. We speak that man, I lose the mic. Man was created. That man was created in the image of God. This is going to be a little rough because I'm holding the Bible. Hang on a second. a hand for Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Where were we? Genesis 2. All right. Living being. Living being. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to make a statement that I believe to be true, that in the beginning, when God created and he breathed into man, he did not intend such a dramatic, such a, he did not intend such a dramatic difference between physical and spiritual when it comes to life. Thank you, sir. You're all right. Look at that, will you? I do not believe that in the perfection that man was created in, that there was to be any big deal between physical life and spiritual life. The intent was it would all be the same, and that God chose to create man with a free will to choose. If he had not created mankind with a free will to choose, 
there's no way we could experience the life that he intended for us. If he would have created us just like the animals, you notice that the only time that Genesis says that God breathed into anybody or anything was mankind. He created the animals. He, he created everything that flew, that swam, that walked, that crawled, and everything that burst forth from the ground. But with, with all of their complexity and all of their purpose and usefulness, God did not breathe into them that they would be a living soul, capable of decision-making, capable of choosing right and wrong. And when he created man, it was the very last of his creation. And he said, it was very good. But had God not created mankind with a will and an ability to choose life or death, and he would not have created man in his own image. So the life that God originally gave to mankind was meant to be everything. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, and it only took another chapter for that to happen, remember they were hiding from God? And it said that in the past, God had walked with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day. And suddenly, Adam was nowhere to be found. Certainly, God knew where Adam was, but sin had separated. I also do not believe that we were built to work and slave and toil and, and just fight to get by. God placed man in the garden. The garden was already created when he put man in it. And all that mankind was supposed to do was tend the garden. But because of sin, because of separation, man had to toil and fight against weeds and, and fight against pests and all of these things that we originally were meant to have dominion over. So the life that God originally planned for us was perfect. And the life that he originally planned, if we chose correctly, would have been a life that, that death, I don't believe physical death was even on the table when God created man. But the effects of sin over the years have brought disease and sickness and the fact that we are all going to face a moment of physical death in our lives unless Jesus comes and takes his church out of here before we reach that point. But it wasn't in God's original plan. In God's original plan, he created life. and Life was meant to be a, a, an incredibly joyful experience free from the agony that we so often face now that makes us say things like, well, that's life. Yeah. Let me look to another passage of Scripture. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. This is verses 1 to 3. Isaiah was used uh, mightily of God as a prophet to Israel. And he's going to give an invitation here, and he's speaking for God. There's an invitation. Now, keep in mind, this is Old Testament. This is before Calvary. This is before Jesus. Not before Jesus was thought of, but before Jesus came to earth, before the Son became a man. And yet, in that period of time, Isaiah spoke the words of God when he said, Isaiah 55, 1 to 3, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money, come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me. With your ears wide open, listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love that I promised 
to David. And he goes on. David was a man after God's own heart. David messed up many times. David was not sinless. But his heart, there was something deep inside of him that he understood that his goal in life was to honor God, not to make a name for himself. Right, right. That, that David got a hold of this. And that set him above so many of the other kings. If you read through Kings and Chronicles, right, you read all about the, you know, then this king came to power and he did not do what was right in the sight of God. And then another king, and he did right, but most of them did not do right in the sight of God. And David was the one that stands out from the rest with a heart after God. Uh, probably David and Josiah, when we, we think of the, the ones who really, really had a heart after God. But David ended well. He started off rough, and he ended well. But he, his heart for God, the, the, the inner spirit of David, was seeking to honor God. And the, Isaiah is writing here in uh, chapter 55 of the book that bears his name that, that when we have that kind of relationship that David had with God, we understand what real life is all about. And he uses an allegory here of food and drink. And, and we're, we're not talking about you don't have to go to the grocery store, right? Can we go a little bit deeper than this? Yes, God does provide for our needs physically, but that isn't what God is speaking here. He's saying, listen, why are you striving for all of the stuff that you think you have to have? Right. Stuff that does not amount to anything. Just follow me, and you'll just have more blessing than you can contain. Yeah. Amen. Huh? And this is what God spoke to his children all through the Old Testament. Won't you stop trying to be like every other nation? Won't you stop worrying about what other people think of you or, or about fitting some mold yeah. that you have created based on what people who are far from God are doing? That's right. And today, many in the church try to do the same thing. They're more concerned with what other people in the world who are far from God will think of them. Even, my goodness, boy, i got to be careful. No, no judgment when I say this. How much do you have to pay for a car? How much do you really have to pay for a car? What, what, what is the motivation for spending $100,000 that you don't have on a car? I just don't understand it. What's the motivation? Is it to, to look better, to say that I have a this or I have a that? Or what, what is it? And meanwhile, God says, I have treasures and blessings for you that you've never even imagined. Just get away from all of the stuff that you think you have to have and pursue me. And you'll find out that I'm going to give you riches far beyond anything you've ever thought possible. Amen. And I think, I think most of us here, at least maybe all of us here, I hope so, get that. That when we turn to him, it shouldn't be begrudgingly. It shouldn't be like, wow, God's really going to cramp my style, but I guess I have to get saved. No, we should run to him. Right. I want to live a life that's free from condem condemnation. I want to live a life that's free from guilt. I want to live a life that's free from addiction. I want to live, live a life that's free from worrying so much about what other people think of me. Yeah. And just understanding who I am in Christ. And this was always God's intent. This was before Jesus came. It's always been God's intent to get to the heart of the matter. Always. Always. And you say, well, why didn't he just make mankind like he did the animals that they didn't really have a choice but to just do things by instinct? Well, what, what fellowship would there be in that? You know, we raise kids and sometimes we have to to have the bumpers and guardrails. And as responsible parents, we do have to, to set up some rules to teach them. But if they never move beyond just doing what they have to do so that mom and dad don't yell at them to a point where they're making the right decisions for themselves, well, then we fail, right, as parents. If, if, uh, if God would have just said, 
don't do this and do this and left it at that. And, and we had no free will. We would just be like another animal. But he made us special because he wanted us to experience real life. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord is right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have been created to desire better things. Right? God has better things for us. He has better things for each of us now. And the more you let go of the things that you think might be important, the more he reveals those better things to you. Thank you, Lord. I want to take us to one more place in Scripture, and that is John chapter 5. Now we're moving past the Old Testament law, which never was intended to save. The sacrificial system, which never was to make holy. And we come into a time when Jesus walked on this earth. And the, the book of John, I've said it many times, the book of John is a fantastic place to start. If, you're, if you want to get into systematic Bible reading and you've, you've really not known where to start, and there's, there's so many people that go to church every Sunday and never read the Bible. This is life. This is life-giving. We, we need to understand exactly what we've been rescued from. It doesn't mean that you have to be a Bible scholar. It doesn't mean you have to know all the addresses. It, it doesn't even apply to one particular translation. It doesn't matter if you read 20 chapters a day or 20 verses. But it's that feeding on the Word of God and understanding that the author of this lives inside of us yes. as born-again children of God. Amen. And we chew on it. We meditate it. But sometimes we just need a little guidance in this and to understand when it was written, who wrote it, who it was written to. All of that makes sense. So the Gospel of John is probably the one that more clearly speaks of the divinity of Christ. That means that Jesus is God in the flesh. doesn't mean we worship three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but that it's this complex union uh, that, that we can't really explain except to say one God in three persons. Three. Yeah, I almost can't do that. Three persons. That God is spirit, that God's Holy Spirit was evident in creation, the Holy Spirit of God hovered over the waters of the deep, and that the Son was preexistent with God for all time. When did God, uh, the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, when did they come on the scene? They never weren't on the scene. And if you're like me, you can't fathom that, but that's okay. We have earthly minds, and we're still walking in flesh. I think someday when we see Him face to face, it'll click. Yes. But in the right time, God sent the Son, and His name is Jesus. So the Gospel of John speaks of that, that, that existence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from before the beginning. It also says more about the love of God than any other gospel. And John is a little unique. It, it, it offers some things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't. It's not against one another, but there's a lot of things in John that aren't in the synoptic gospels. So, when we read chapter 5, I want to read one verse here, and that is verse 24. Jesus is speaking. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Amen. He says, those who hear my words, Jesus' words, those who hear his words and believe God have eternal life. So what's that mean? Well, it's more than believe in God. It's believe God, those who trust God, those who take Him at His word, those who walk by faith. It's all by faith. Have you ever seen your salvation? 
Can you point to it? It's all by faith. By faith in the living Son of God and what He accomplished on Calvary. What made Him so special? He was fully God yet fully man. Never sinned, but yet paid sin's penalty of death and defeated death by rising again. If, if Jesus, people will fight you all the time that Jesus can't be the only way. Well, then show me another human being that, that meets all those qualifications, and I'll consider your argument. But other than that, I'm sorry. There's one way. There's one God and one Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and I hope you all know that. If you want to talk about that sometime and you're not sure, even if you're watching by stream, I'd be glad to talk to you about that. Um, he says, we'll miss judgment. Think about that. I mean, there'd be a judgment, we call it the, the Bema Seat judgment, right? The judgment of works and evaluating what we did with our life. But that's not a judgment of going to heaven or hell. But we have, we've passed from this. We, we, we don't stand in judgment of our past. We judge our past. Huh? Anyone ever had a hard time letting go of that? It, trying to understand what God doesn't even remember. Just take a moment and let that sink in. That God doesn't remember your past. If, if it's under the blood of Jesus. It's gone. No judgment for those who are in Christ. When God looks upon you, He sees you as if you've never sinned. Wow, that's far beyond anything we can do, whether it's ourselves or somebody else. And he says, why? Because you've passed from death unto life. One of my favorite revivalists, Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, a lot of good stuff on YouTube if you look him up. He's been gone now for quite a while, but uh, he said, show me how you can pass from death to life by repeating a prayer. But yet it can be just as instantaneous. Coming to the end of your own life, your own sinful condition, that that passing from death to life is as simple as receiving Jesus. But in a lot of cases, we don't talk about that anymore. We don't talk about the seriousness of sin and what it will do. We don't talk about the reality of hell and separation from God for all eternity. And we just want to say, um, you want to get your, maybe we don't say it, but we intimate it. You want your life to get better real quick? Just say this prayer after me. We'll give you a Bible and we'll make you a member. And there's no, there's no fulfillment in that. You can't pass from death to life by repeating some prayer. I'm sorry. You can't. You can pass from death to life to get into a point where you say, God, I can't do this anymore. And from your heart saying, I trust Jesus as my only hope. And Jesus assured people that, that when that happens, and this was even before he went to Calvary. You see, God's heart has always been for the heart of man. Always. He, didn't, he wasn't a different God in the Old Testament as he was in the New Everything in the Old Testament, though, is more physical. We see battles. They're physical battles of people killing one another, you know? Like my friend that says, I like the Old Testament. If you didn't like someone, you just killed them, you know? <laughs> he was kidding, of course. But, but even in the midst of that, the people weren't getting it, you see? They didn't have the benefit of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So all they could do was try to reform themselves from the outside. And they did really stupid things. Today, we have the benefit, if we're in Christ, of having the Holy Spirit dwell within us. We still do stupid things, but we have the potential to understand things like this, real life, what real life is, what God has planned for us from the very, very beginning. This new life starts the moment you give yourself to Jesus and just lasts forever. So, 
I know sometimes we get in habits of saying things, but can we try real hard not to say things like, well, that's life, what are you going to do? Because, see, what we say matters. It, it plants things in our minds, and it plants things in others' minds. How can we say that we're redeemed and living a brand new life if we walk around bad-mouthing the life we have now? There is power in a, in a life lived for Jesus. No matter what's going on around us, we can live above it. We, we can live lives that honor God regardless of what everybody around us is doing. You've got to get used to the fact that not everyone is going to like you and be your friend. We don't have to be their enemies either. When you say, life is good because God is good, huh? Amen. Jesus really actually reaffirmed God's original plan for mankind. That plan got covered up by sin. Jesus came. He removed that sin. He doesn't necessarily, uh, we, we don't necessarily miss the consequences of sin. But even in that, there's grace. There's restoration. And there's hope. The one thing I really love about this congregation is that if someone comes in to our place that, that looks different than people we're normally used to seeing, or maybe is dressed a little bit uh, shabbier than we're used to seeing. You don't, you don't make any big deal of it. You just welcome them. Amen. And that's awesome. Yes. So as we continue to reach out to people that are hurt and broken, you know what? We, <laughs> we got to make sure that we've got our minds set on receiving people as they are. Right. You know, we give them the gospel. We tell them that Jesus loves them. And we point to a better way. But by no means can we reject anybody. And there may be some things in this world that is constantly uh, seems to be becoming more against God, I guess we could say. If there are people that come that maybe uh, we're really not used to seeing. You know, in the, in the early 70s and late 60s, early 70s, in the Jesus movement, it was tie-dyed pants and long hair and bare feet. Today it's nose rings and purple hair and two women holding hands and two men holding hands and all this kind of stuff. But God help us if we ever tell someone they can't come in here. God help us. Because Jesus' offer of forgiveness is for everybody. Come and let him change you. Right? Amen. This is a good place to be. It's a good place to be. Religion obscures freedom. Religion obscures freedom because we hear free and we think free to do anything I want. But true freedom in Christ, the life that he gives, it's freedom from sin. It's freedom to live for him. As I share with people that are going through addictions and, and these kind of things, I'll say you are under no obligation to listen to the voice that wants to destroy you. You are not obligated to listen to the voice that wants to enslave you. You are under no obligation to listen to anyone that tells you that you can't live for Jesus. And the enemy of our souls oftentimes in our minds will tell us these things. You have to keep doing this because that's what you are. You'll never be free. You'll never be valuable. You'll never be worthy. You'll never be good enough. You are under no obligation to listen to those voices. Thank you, Jesus. And religion steps in and says, you, you are valuable to God because of what you do and don't do. Right. That you are good, that you are able to stand before God depending on how good you are. And there is no, no good, no good that we could do that would give us the right to stand before a holy God apart from Jesus Christ. We get beyond any of that and we start counting up our good deeds and say, well, I'm really a good person. Well, 
maybe by the world's standards, but none of us are good. None of us are righteous in and of ourselves. But in Christ, we are justified that God can look at us just as if we'd never sinned. Hallelujah. Physical struggle obscures life. When, when we struggle to get through one day, that when we look at a picture like that, that young lady laying in that field on a beautiful day and smiling, we look at that and all we have is envy because we can't imagine us ever being able to look like that. And if your struggle is purely physical, you'll never understand that. But if you understand the lengths to which God went to in Christ to secure that for you, and when we just say, I will live a blessed life, it just changes everything. It just changes everything. Life is good because God is good. And this is the kind of life that God intended from the very beginning, before sin entered the world. Today is Palm Sunday. And we think about the triumphal entry of Jesus on a donkey into Jerusalem. And if you've been in church all your life, maybe as a kid, you had the palm branches and and we waved palm branches around remembering that they laid the branches and their cloaks on the ground as Jesus came in on the donkey in the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. And I do believe that most of the people that were cheering him on believed that he was coming into town to set up a new government. That finally the Romans were going to get kicked out. Finally their Messiah had come Finally, he was going to put Israel back on the map. And I see Jesus coming in on that donkey amidst the cheers and the hosannas. I see him coming through very quiet and perhaps with a tear in his eye, thinking, you just don't understand the kind of life I came to give you. Because in less than a week, he will have been tried, convicted, and hung on a cross. And many today still don't understand what he came for. Many today come to an altar of prayer thinking, if I just, if I just come to Jesus, then all of the stuff in my life's going to be fixed. That yay, Jesus. But when it comes to walking with him, and for him, they don't have much staying power. Living for Jesus is a lifestyle. It's not a one-time thing. It's a lifestyle. Trusting Jesus for forgiveness is instant. You can be changed in an instant. You are forgiven in an instant. He begins that process of making you brand new but you know what? It's long haul thinking. It's, it's a statement of faith that says, no matter what, I'm going to follow him. And when we think about Jesus coming into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, we call it. I, I'm sure a lot of the people were disappointed when he ended up being hung on a cross. I'm sure a lot of people thought we had our hopes up. I thought that this was just going to change everything. We, we looked forward to the day that he was going to come in triumphantly into our capital city. But now, my hopes are dashed. And there are people today that do the same thing. They'll make some effort to say a sinner's prayer or to come to church or to, to try to do the right thing or to pray or read their Bible, and they give it about four days and if everything isn't fixed, they give up. And just like a lot of the people gave up on Good Friday, when Christ was hung on a cross, there's a lot of people today that give up because they don't understand that following Jesus is a lifestyle. We're not earning our way into heaven. It's still by grace through faith. 
but it's the whole nine yards. It says, I will follow Jesus. I will live for him. I will be holy. I will set my sights on things that matter. I will pursue life that is more than just day-to-day drudgery. I will not despise my time here on earth. I will not just get saved and hang on till heaven. I will live the life that God has intended me to live while I'm here so that when it's time for me to leave this earth and this mortal clay that we walk in, I've just moved from one life into another. It's what God intended for us. Don't just be satisfied to just hang on until heaven. But you don't know what's happened to me. You don't know what people have said to me. You don't know how my life has been. You don't know the sickness I deal with. You don't know. Jesus bore all of that for you and for me. Man, I just pray that when the, when the songs are done being sung and the, the hallelujahs are done being raised in a place like this and you sense his presence, I just pray that when you leave this place that you are built on something more solid than just that momentary emotional high. I I pray that you're built on something more solid, even more solid than the promise of heaven for those who are born again. And that's great. Don't get me wrong. But I hope that your life is so built on Christ that no matter what faces you when you walk out the doors, that you can say, life is good. Life is good because God is good. Understand the life that he came to give you, full and free and rich. Be willing to do some risking. Take some risk in this life. Step up to the plate. Go ahead. Step in in faith. Lord, I will be more bold for you. I don't know how you're going to take me and make me bold, but I know you are. Lord, I'm going to see the best in people when, when I see them rather than being so critical. When I come into church, I'm going to come with an attitude of participating and serving, not just a consumer mindset. Huh? Live your life knowing that life is good and it's precious here on earth. Let's make every second count.